And Frank and Max, you can see that um, participant number on the bottom of the screen, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, watching it creep up. 53, 55. <clears throat> I think we max out at 2,000. So if it gets to. <laughs> I'll start. That'd be pretty sweet if we reach 2,000. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> It is a good rainy evening activity. It's pouring here. It feels like oh, really? outside. Oh, that's a bummer. It's like oh, yeah. it's bluer too. here in Silverton right now. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. That out. We haven't gotten any snow in a while. How's though. the snow there? It's it's shallow. Okay. <laughs> that's the best way. There's been a there's been a lot of um like the basal facet layer has been failing a lot. So we'll be seeing a lot of avalanches to the ground. Yeah, um, other than that, bummer. nothing really, there's not been any action. People get all psyched about early season snow, not, not realizing that that sets you up for yeah. troublesome snowpack for months. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I've been, I've been looking in, looking at it every time I go out and it's just getting worse. Hopefully we get a storm. Yeah. Well, hope, right, hopefully you'll get it buried. Yeah. It looks like Stay everyone's buried. just ice climbing Stay in the buried. hole right now. I've been seeing a ton of ice climbing posts and out of Tuckerman. Yeah. Yeah, plenty of, plenty of water flowing and pentacles getting climbed and black bike was climbed. And oh, that's sick. I think, um, you know, yeah, could could be that kind of season. I was looking back through my, I used my um, Google search tool in my photos to look at all mountain photos uh -huh. um, in November that's so back through the yeah. last 10 or 12 years and uh, you know this is not that unusual like it's it's more memorable I think when we get an early season snow so when you go yeah. into a year like this you think oh man this is lame so dry you know but looking yeah. back we had a lot of cases where you know there was hardly anything on the ground into December or we had an early season snow like we had this year and Mm -hmm. you know it melts and we're back to ground ground floor um yeah makes come sense november december or january even we yeah not unusual it's it's capricious new england weather yeah so. especially after last well, it year it looks like, like we're leveling off great. around a, oh yeah. yeah yeah the the big the big snow years make the low snow years all feel even worse <laughs> yeah exactly um got about 100 people got a 703 so this is kind of a good uh north conway casual start sweet we, oh, still some fashionably late people coming out <laughs> makes give sense it, give it another minute or two Yeah, so sweet seeing everyone trickle in. Thanks to everyone who's here already for coming. Yep. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. A little after seven here. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to uh, continuing education series here for Mount Washington Avalanche Center and the White Mountain Avalanche Education Foundation. Um, we're joined today by a student who um, reached out to us at the Avalanche Center for some data to grab our Excel files of our snow plot and weather data that we've been gathering pretty consistently for I think about 12 years now. Um, and, you know, like many other requests, I think, oh gosh, okay, here we go. I'll, I'll get that out to him, see what we get. And uh, so, you know, oftentimes we provide that data, never really hear anything, or we might, you know, we may hear something, we might get a paper. Every once in a while we get surprised. Um, but I have to say that Max Bond, who's presenting tonight, uh, has really gone above and beyond what most folks have produced and uh, is really knocking it out of the park here and, and dug in deep. Um, with our data and um, applied some really cool tools. Um, I think the machine learning um, equation that I think, uh, or that algorithm that 
Liz Burakowski came up with and you ran with. Um, it's really fascinating. I'm uh, looking forward to the day when I can um, make that like our, our fist and our ranger up on the room to double check our forecast, uh, or at least like indicate something that we may have missed. But I don't want to go on all night. I'll just hand it over to, to Max. He's a government senior and uh, he might be joined by his uh, faculty advisor, Eric Osterberg, who's done a lot of, done a lot of research on uh, this topic. And um, so go ahead and take it away, Max. Hey, thank you so much, Frank. I really appreciate that nice introduction. Uh, and I'm going to say this a million times over, like this, this project has shown me that avalanche forecasters are definitely irreplaceable. The, the best computer models cannot do your guys' job. And this project would have been absolutely impossible if it wasn't for the hard work by you guys at the Mount Washington Avalanche Center. So here we go. Uh, my name is Max Bond, and I'm a recent graduate of Dartmouth College right here in New Hampshire. And this research was for my undergraduate thesis. So I'm not a career scientist. I'm not an expert in the field. I'm just really a guy who's really interested in avalanches and interested in climate change. Um, I'm an avid skier, actually a split boarder. I get a lot of flack for that. And, you know, one night I was laying awake thinking about skiing and thinking about climate change. And I started to wonder how might avalanche conditions change in the future with changing climate? So I originally reached out to Frank and the Mount Washington Avalanche Center for help gathering avalanche and weather data. And they were extremely helpful. And once I had the chance to show Frank the work that we were doing, he became a little bit more interested in the project and invited me here to give this talk today. So I am extremely excited to present to all of you. And I really want today to be more of a conversation and less of a lecture. Please feel free to ask anything you'd like about the methodology, the results, and my interpretations of the data. I plan on presenting for about 30 to 45 minutes because I don't want to bore anyone. And I'd like to save the remaining time for a Q&A and then a discussion amongst us all about the topics presented. So here we go. So climate change is affecting all sorts of natural hazards which threaten our communities, such as just recently the forest fires and hurricanes. And one such hazard which threatens our communities are snow avalanches. And you might be thinking these just really, these must just affect backcountry skiers and climbers, right? Well, not really. Often overshadowed by other natural hazards, avalanches are a serious natural threat which have killed over 1,100 people in the US since 1950 and cost millions of dollars in damages. Iceland alone has spent $41 million in damages since 1974. These phenomena especially affect anybody living in mountain towns. This here is a picture of Silent Bob, an avalanche which occurred in Summit County, Colorado while I was living and working there in 2019. That was a an historic avalanche cycle in, in Colorado and was incredibly destructive. One avalanche struck Highway I-70, shutting off access from Denver and stopping people, my own friends, from getting to work. Another avalanche struck a gas line, causing a massive leak and prompting evacuations from town. And immediately after, those around me started talking about how this could be due to climate change and we might need to expect more events like this in the future. So that question, because of that avalanche cycle, is what prompted me to think of this study when I came home to New Hampshire. So why would climate change affect avalanches? Well, climate change affects the weather, and we all know that weather affects avalanches, especially in maritime climates like Mount Washington. Some refer to it as a quick action snowpack, with avalanche activity increasing during and just after a storm, with conditions quickly settling down in the days after a storm. This makes Mount Washington's avalanche activity particularly susceptible to changes in weather due to changing climate. So other studies have already looked into climate change effects on avalanche activity in other mountain ranges around the world, including the Himalaya, the French Alps, and the Rocky Mountains, just to name a few. A 2018 study in the Western Indian Himalaya found an increase in overall avalanche activity over the last 150 years and an increase in the proportion of wet avalanches due to increased frequency of temperatures crossing the freezing point, along with a sustained amount of snowfall. They also found an increase in runout distance of wet slab avalanches, likely due to increased water content in the snowpack, decreasing friction, so avalanches have the ability to run farther. A 2001 study in the French Alps found a slight decrease in overall avalanche activity through the end of the 21st century, 
mostly due to changes in midwinter and late spring. Furthermore, they also found an increase in the proportion of wet avalanches. Brian Lazar, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center Deputy Director, modeled the annual timing of wet avalanche activity in Aspen, Colorado through the end of the 21st century and found an earlier shift to wet avalanche conditions each year with the magnitude of that shift dependent on future greenhouse gas emissions. So as we can see, there are two contradictory, contradictory predictions for what climate change might do to avalanche activity. Number one, you might expect decreasing snowfall and increasing temperatures to lead to less avalanche activity. Or two, you might ex expect more extreme events and larger temperature swings to lead to more volatile conditions and more avalanche activity. So less av avalanche activity or more avalanche activity, both due to climate change. Furthermore, the same changes in weather that might affect avalanche activity also have economic effects on winter tourism. You may, you may know Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski from her work with Protect Our Winters, aka POW, and all sorts of other cool research she's done. She's extremely rad and an excellent splitboarder, and she found that warming global temperatures will have a significant effect on the winter tourism economy here in New England. So throughout New England and on, and on Mount Washington, climate change is apparent. Temperatures have risen steadily on Mount Washington, about a degree and a half Fahrenheit since 1935, and regionally we're seeing decreases in snowfall. One previous study investigated large-scale climate patterns with Mount Washington avalanche activity and found interesting results, including significant relationships between the North Atlantic Oscillation, snowfall, and avalanche activity. However, specific temporal trends were not investigated, so they, didn't, they did not look at changes through time. And thus, no previous study has explored temporal changes in Mount Washington avalanche activity. So if we're going to investigate changes through time, we need some sort of record of avalanche activity, an avalanche time series. Now, one method for this is to directly observe avalanches. However, this can be very difficult as avalanches often occur during periods of poor visibility. Just ask Frank and the rest of the MWAC. They can't be out there observing avalanches 24 seven. Also, observational data sets are dependent on how many people are out recreating and observing avalanches. An increase in avalanche observations could just mean an increase in user activity. Tree cores have also been used in previous studies, as you can see the effects of avalanches striking a tree in its tree rings. This is how a previous study in the Himalaya studied avalanche activity, and how Martin and Germain 2017 on Mount Washington studied avalanche and climate relationships. In this study, we explored the use of avalanche forecast information as proxy data for avalanche activity. Avalanche forecasts contain a lot of valuable information about the avalanche conditions on a given day. They might not be perfect as they are simply the avalanche forecasters best predictions of what conditions will look like that day. But with the great forecasters like Frank and the rest of the MWAC who are awesome at their jobs, we believe for the purpose of this study, their predictions are plenty accurate. To put it another way, this would be analogous to studying climate change by looking at weather forecasts. They might not be entirely correct for any given day, but you'll still see the trends through time. We are lucky enough to have 10 years from 2011 to 2020 of archived avalanche forecasts on the MWAC website. And I know most of you have probably seen plenty of these, but if you've never seen one before, I will walk us through three key features of an avalanche forecast, which we focused on in this study. So one, we have the danger rating. This is on a one to five ordinal scale relating to the likelihood, size, and spatial distribution of avalanches. So already a decent metric of overall avalanche activity. We also have the avalanche type or referred to as the avalanche problem. Obviously there are many avalanche problems, but they really fall into two main types, wet or dry. So we're gonna focus on those two sort of regimes of avalanche activity, wet or dry. And likelihood. Again, this is related to the danger rating. The higher the danger rating, the higher the, the avalanche likelihood. For this study, we defined a likely avalanche day as any day with a danger rating greater than or equal to three or considerable, as by definition, a considerable danger rating means that human triggered avalanches are likely. So again, we have 10 years of these forecasts archived by the MWAC. For this study, I read through each and every one of those forecasts, 1,252 to be exact and quantified each into a data set for use in this project and which will be posted on MWAC's website for future research. But I know what you're thinking. We're, we only have about 10 years of avalanche forecasts. 
That's not long enough of a data set to investigate long-term long temporal trends due to changing climate. So what we did was we used observed weather data from Mount Washington from 2010 to 2011 or to 2020 and our avalanche forecast data set to create statistical models which can predict avalanche forecasts given weather data. That way we can project avalanche conditions into the past and project into the future just using weather data. So we created ordinal logistic regression models to predict the avalanche danger rating and random forest models to predict the avalanche type. Random forest is a machine learning technique which creates a series of decision trees, all of which work together to make predictions on new data. We combined our avalanche models with observed weather data from 1950 to present to investigate past changes in weather in, 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 in avalanche activity and combined our avalanche models with CMIP-5 global climate model simulation output from 1980 to 2100 to investigate potential future changes in avalanche activity. So this is gonna be our trail map for the rest of the presentation. So let's get on with it. I want to start out by saying that this MWAC and MWAB data set is really amazing. It truly is rare to get such high quality data on a daily basis at high elevations like Mount Washington. The data set allows us to do all sorts of cool analyses and we immediately began plotting up the avalanche data with meteorological data to investigate theoretical relationships. As you can see here, periods of higher snowfall are met with higher avalanche danger ratings, exactly what we'd expect. Again, we see that positive correlation between snowfall and avalanche danger, but we can also look at trends specific to certain avalanche types. We can see here on the right-hand side that wet avalanche activity is associated with positive swings in the daily temperature maximum, which is empirically expected. Rapid rise in temperature, wet avalanche activity. So we use these observed relationships to create our statistical models to predict avalanche forecast information. Our ordinal logistic and random forest models incorporated the daily temperature maximum, daily temperature minimum, temperature maximum swing, so the difference between today and yesterday's temperature maximums, precipitation, snowfall, so today's new snowfall, five-day sum of snowfall, so the sum of snowfall over the last five days, snow depth, and a multiplicative variable, snow depth times the precipitation. So our models do decently well, and when compared to similar studies, we meet the precedent set by earlier research. We can predict the danger rating with a 65% accuracy, the likelihood, so likely or not likely, with 81% accuracy, and the avalanche type, wet or dry, with 91% accuracy. Now, while we have confidence that these models can capture trends through time, I would like to emphasize how these could never replace the job of an avalanche forecaster. If anything, this study has shown me how important it is to have real experts out there making these kind of decisions. Our best computer models, machine learning models, could not do the job. So from 1950 to present, we paired these avalanche models with observed weather data from the Mount Washington summit. Given the chart I showed earlier, we know that temperature has increased on Mount Washington. And consequently, we see about a 16% increase in wet avalanche activity from 1950 to present. Notice, not a massive change, only about two days per decade, but a statistically significant trend over the last 70 years. When we look at these trends in wet avalanche activity by month, we can see an apparent shortening of the winter. So I'm sure the skiers in the audience all know that each season, we see this shift from a dry avalanche regime to a wet avalanche regime. And this shift appears to be moving earlier and earlier into the season with significant increases in March, April, and May. Now, looking at overall avalanche activity and snowfall, we observe no overall change in seasonal snowfall or the seasonal number of likely avalanche days. This is unlike seasonal trends where we're seeing these steady declines in snowfall. We do, however, see big cycles of big snowfall years and low snowfall years, which I'm sure we have all observed empirically. We were just talking about how this year seems to be a pretty low November. So this led us to wonder what causes these big snowfall years. Snowfall is clearly an important predictor of avalanche activity. So whatever is controlling snowfall is also controlling avalanche activity. We thought maybe large scale climate patterns play an important role in Mount Washington snowfall. I'm sure most people have heard of El Nino. That's an example of a large scale climate pattern which can affect the weather here in New England. There are actually a whole bunch of these climate patterns like El Nino and each has an associated index to quantify, quantify their strength and periodicity. 
We gathered index data for the North Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO, the El Nino, or El Nino Southern Oscillation, aka ENSO, the Pacific North American Index, or PNA, the Atl Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or AMO, and the Meridional Circulation Index, or MCI, which is an indicator of jet stream waviness. We compared these different indices with observed Mount Washington snowfall, both from the summit and at Pinkham Notch. I won't go into the, the details of what each of these indices actual, actually measures. So if you have any questions about any of them, I'd be happy to answer at the end. On this plot, we can see that the North Atlantic Oscillation and Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation are significant predictors of snowfall on Mount Washington summit. However, the AMO is not significant if the 1970s, which was an anomalously high decade of snowfall, are removed from the data set. Thus, we believe the NAO is the best predictor we could find for Mount Washington summit snowfall. Not El Nino, which I hear many skiers talking about in the parking lot. While El Nino does play a massive role in seasonal snowfall for other locations, such as the Pacific Northwest and California, it, ap it appears to play no role in Mount Washington snowfall. We can see this relationship between Mount Washington snowfall and the North Atlantic Oscillation in global sea level pressure maps. The NAO is defined as the difference between the Icelandic low, a low pressure system off the coast of Iceland, and the Azores high, a high pressure system off the coast of the Azores Islands. So this plot is showing the difference in sea level pressure from the top 10 snowfall years, the best snowfall years, and the bottom 10 snowfall years, the lowest. So we're seeing these red colors around the Icelandic low, meaning that in the high snowfall years, the Icelandic low had higher pressures than it did during the bottom 10 snowfall years. And likewise, we see blue colors around the Azores high, meaning the Azores high had lower pressures during the top 10 snowfall years than it did during the bottom 10 snowfall years. Since the NAO is defined as the difference between these two pressure systems, we would expect a higher or a lower NAO to have higher snowfall. So again, lower NAO, higher snowfall. And that is exactly what we see in our data. So a lower NAO value means higher snowfall on Mount Washington summit. This is consistent with Martin and Germain 2017, who also studied the relationship between snowfall, avalanches, and the NAO on Mount Washington summit, and they found the exact same result. So we've talked a whole bunch about the past. Now let's start talking about the future. So we needed future weather data to provide our avalanche models. And we thought, why not use state-of-the-art global climate model simulations produced by some of the best modelers in the world? These models are basically a set of mathematical equations that use physics to predict daily weather data at different grid locations across the globe. These models incorporate all sorts of things such as deforestation, transportation patterns, human population size, et cetera, et cetera. Just to get an idea of how detailed these models are, I once met a researcher whose entire career was spent studying the shapes of tropical trees because trees are made of carbon and the shapes and sizes of tree trunks impact the model's estimates of how much carbon tropical rainforests can hold. Now, obviously one of the most important variables in these models is greenhouse gas emissions. So we can run models with increasing human emissions or decreasing human emissions, or no human emissions at all and see what the, what, what the different weather outputs look like. You can see on these, these graphs that different carbon emission scenarios lead to different temperature predictions. The models we use in this study feature two carbon emission scenarios, RCP 8.5, which is considered a high emission scenario, and RCP 4.5, which is a low emissions scenario. The problem is global climate models produce data at quite coarse spatial resolution. They produce square grids, which are quite large, about 110 kilometers wide. Thus, the resolution of GCM data is way too coarse for our purposes. It would not capture the weather on Mount Washington. Luckily for us, we know Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski, who helped us statistically downscale the GCM data to a finer resolution, about a seven kilometer grid, using a new downscaling technique called the localized constructed analogs, or LOCA technique. With finer resolution data, we can expect the LOCA output to be much more representative of the weather on Mount Washington. So LOCA data gives us daily maximum and minimum temperature and precipitation. However, for our, for our avalanche models, we also needed snowfall and snow depth. 
Luckily, Dr. Bur Burakowski came to our rescue again with UNH's water balance model, which incorporates Mount Washington's elevation to estimate snowfall and snow depth given the LOCA output. Thus, finally, we had GCM output data through the end of the 21st century, which was statistically downscaled to a seven kilometer grid encompassing Mount Washington and adjusted to Mount Washington's elevation. In fact, we actually had 29 different CMIP-5 global climate models, all downscaled and adjusted to Mount Washington, which is a ton of data to manage. So my computer and my own sanity just could not handle it. So we selected five of the 29 models to use, which spanned the range of potential changes in temperature and precipitation from 1980 to 2100. The average of these models does a great job capturing the observed trends in weather. Here we have plots of daily temperature maximum and seasonal sum of snowfall. The average of the five selected GCMs is in blue and the observed data is in orange. Notice the observed data has more year to year variation or large spikes, but each of the individual global climate models have the same amount of variation or spikes. The blue line is just an average of the five, so it smooths out all of the variation. Now notice this plot is from 1980 to 2005. That is because these global climate models were created in 2005. It takes many years to publish models of these caliber. So while they are the best models available, they actually only use observed inputs such as observed carbon emissions, observed human population, et cetera, through 2005. And everything after 2005 is a prediction of what the future could look like. Thus, as we look at future trends predicted by the models, please keep in mind, these were not created in 2020. The year 2020 means nothing to these models. All right, so let's look at the future. We combined our newly created avalanche forecast models with the LOCA downscaled GCM data to project avalanche conditions into the future. And contrary to what we saw from 1950 to 2020, there is a significant decrease in overall avalanche activity from 1980 to 2100. However, the magnitude of this change depends on the emission scenario. Under high emissions, there is an 85% decrease in the number of likely avalanche days per season versus a 77% decrease under reduced emissions. This decrease is likely driven by a decrease in snowfall, but again, the decrease depends on emissions. We see about a 30% decrease in the high emission scenario and about a 17% decrease in the low emission scenario. We have the opportunity to almost half the change in snowfall on Mount Washington through reduced emissions. This is a real world example of how it is not too late to act on climate change. Here we can see the monthly trends in snowfall and I'd like you to pay attention to the early spring, particularly March and April. As you can see, the projected changes in early spring are entirely dependent on future emissions. If climate change were an election map, these are the swing states. This is where our actions can make a huge difference. And much like the wet avalanche results shown from 1950 to present, this also represents a relative shortening of the winter. And again, we see that similar shortening of the winter and a similar battle between emission scenarios in the monthly wet avalanche activity. So just as we saw in seasonal snowfall, there's an important difference here between the emission scenarios. Notice the difference. We see an increase in the rate of change of wet avalanche activity under high emissions and a decrease in the rate of change under low emissions. The changes in wet avalanche activity are likely driven by these changes in daily maximum and minimum temperature. Under low emissions, the daily temperature maximum increases by 3.9 degrees Celsius and the daily minimum temperature by 4.2, with the Tmax breaching freezing by 2090, as opposed to a 6.12 and 6.5 degree change under high emissions, with Tmax breaching freezing by 2060. Let's take a moment to recognize how insane that is. On average, the warmest part of the day, from December through May, atop Mount Washington, the top of New England, could be above freezing by 2060. That is insane. So we know that overall avalanche activity is expected to decrease. But what does this mean for the average recreationalist? The answer is not that simple. Given the changes in weather that we have presented, the avalanche hazard could become even more complex and unpredictable than we currently observe. Consider this. 
Midwinter snowfall stays about the same. So there's the same amount of input into the system. While wet avalanche activity increases. With increased temperatures dancing right around the freezing point, we're going to see an increase in the, num in the number of thaw events, more water percolation through the snowpack, more frozen crust layers forming along with more near crust faceting and higher density snowfall, all of which can lead to a more unstable snowpack. Furthermore, while it does decrease significantly, we still see a very relevant number of high avalanche danger days. So days with rating of high or above, indicating the remaining presence of elevated avalanche activity through the end of the 21st century. As a recreationalist, I'd be expecting more variable midwinter avalanche conditions on Mount Washington than we currently observe. No more wind slab every single day for the entire winter. It's, it's not gonna look like that anymore. Generally, if I had to take a guess, I'd predict we're going to see more events like this one. A massive wet slab avalanche, which occurred on January 14th, 2018 on the lip of Tuckerman Ravine. This was quite a large event and given the increasing temperatures and all the associated effects on the snowpack stability, along with persistent midwinter snowfall, I'd expect to see more of these in a warmer future. In fact, this has already been recorded in the Himalaya where the previous study I mentioned found an increase in wet avalanche activity resulting in increased runout distance or the distance that avalanches can travel due to more water in the system causing decreased friction. Despite these scary results, I'd like to take a moment to review how we have a chance to make a difference. Our future greenhouse gas emissions will play a significant role in Mount Washington's future. Let's go over some key statistics. The number of likely avalanche days, an 85% decrease versus a 77% decrease. But you might be asking, wait, we don't really want avalanches. They, they are dangerous. Well, maybe not, but we do want snowfall, both for personal and economic benefit. Annual snowfall, a 30% decrease versus a 17% decrease. That's almost half the change under reduced emissions. Wet avalanche days, a 66% increase versus a 50% increase. And finally, daily temperature maximum, a 6.12 degree Celsius change versus a 3.92 degree change. To sum it all up, we have digitized avalanche forecasts, creating a robust avalanche data set for this study and for future research. We created statistical models using observed weather data and the avalanche forecast data set. We utilize these avalanche models to reconstruct avalanche activity in the past and investigated climatological connections to Mount Washington snowfall. And finally, we used our models to project avalanche activity into the future. Climate change has affected mountain weather and avalanche activity on Mount Washington and will continue to do so through 2100. We have the ability to curtail these changes through reduced emissions. By studying these changes in avalanches and changes in other natural hazards, we can better understand their behavior in a future warmer world. For acknowledgements, I'd like to thank the researchers of the Mount Washington Observatory, the tireless efforts by the Mount Washington Avalanche Center, MWAC forecaster Jeff Fongamy for his help gathering data, and MWAC director Frank Karras for his assistance throughout the entirety of this project and for inviting me here to speak today. Also, thanks to Mark Sinnott for participating in a personal interview about the project. I'd like to thank NOAA and climatereanalyzer.org for providing open source data to all, supporting science around the world. Dartmouth Undergraduate Advising and Research for funding three years of my previous work with Eric Osterberg, Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski for being my second reader and processing the GCM for this project and just generally being awesome, Trevor Partridge, Dr. Jonathan Winter, and Dr. Eric Kelsey for assisting with data and statistics, and of course, my absolutely incredible advisor, without whom this project would have gone nowhere, Dr. Eric Osterberg. And of course, lastly, my family. So any questions? Hey, thanks for that, Max. That was great. Um, I have a ton of questions. Sweet. Unfortunately, my um, inter internet was a, a little bit unstable. So oh, I, no. my questions might not seem uh, really uh, on target, but um, I will just throw in a, uh, just from this forecaster, I will say I'll take a wind slab avalanche problem over a wet slab anytime yeah for no other reason i, I agree there's not lot, snow falling lot. on uh, or rain falling on snow down in the woods oh so yeah let's open it up to the floor um 
see if anyone oh. could, you can raise your hand or we'll take uh, questions from the Q&A. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A for... right now. So let me grab a couple of those and then um, we'll open it up for uh, live questions. So first question I got here is uh, what's the NOA prediction for this season? Oh, that's a good question. I can't actually answer that. Maybe maybe Eric could answer. Do they forecast the North Atlantic Oscillation? No. So un unfortunately, we can't project the NAO out more than a week, maybe two max. So the, the unusually or unseasonably warm temperatures we've had in northern New England for the last two, two to three weeks since basically October early 20s is because we've shifted to an NAO positive phase. And what that does is it, it basically locks all the cold polar air further to the north. It, it prevents it from coming south to where we are. So um, unfortunately, it looks like we're in this NAO positive warm pattern for another week, maybe two. Uh, hopefully, we'll see a switch in the pattern for um, you know, around Christmas time and beyond, but it's, we, we actually have, a, we cannot predict that more than a week or so. Makes sense. Yeah, hopefully it switches soon. Eric, can you do just a quick intro of yourself in case anybody missed um, your role in this project? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So my name's Eric Osterberg. I'm an associate professor of earth sciences. I'm, I'm really a climate scientist. My specialty is uh, ice cores and ice core research in Greenland, Alaska, and Antarctica. And I'm doing a lot of climate research in New England in the last few years. And I'm at Dartmouth College. And so I was Max's senior thesis advisor on this project. And uh, I apologize for joining late, but the storm knocked out our power here at home. And I got oh, no. kids and a family, so I had to make sure we were good. And luckily it came <laughs> back on. Okay, Max, I got another question. Um, totally. A clarification on were the reduced emissions predictions based on global, national, or regional emissions? Yeah, so that is based on global emissions. Yeah, that's based on global. So all of the future projection, projections were using global climate models. So these are including global emissions. So yeah, definitely not just regional or national emissions. And, and just to emphasize, these scenarios that Max is using these are the same scenarios that all the global climate modelers around the world have agreed upon. These are the same scenarios that you'll find discussed in, for example, the, the IPCC reports, if you're familiar with those, and also the national climate assessment reports that come out just from the United States every few years. So these are very well known um, uh, scenarios of what the future might be like uh, to, to climate scientists. It's the, it's the language that we use with the climate models. Uh, there was a hand up in the, here we go. Um, Russ Costa, I'm going to open you up to open your mic up. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. I had a question. I'm normally based out of Utah. I'm actually in Boston now, but cool. Yeah. Um, one of the questions we talk about a lot is, how this pattern of warming um, will vary by elevation. You know, warming and associated wet slide, uh, wet avalanche activity. Um, although limited Mount Washington, certainly this would help expand your model um, outside of the zone for how this might work at other elevations because temperatures and snowfall is gonna work a lot different at say uh, 8,000 feet or 10,000 feet or 4,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Russ, you are entirely correct. In fact, there are papers on Mount Washington specifically that show that climate change effects, especially temperature changes, are different based on the elevation. So one example I showed was, if you remember, I showed from, 19, from 1950 to present that we saw no overall change in snowfall. But regionally, we have seen a decrease in snowfall. That's like one really quick and dirty example of how climate change effects can be sort of delayed with elevation. And to, just to clarify, my models are very specific to Mount Washington. So they use the observed weather data from Mount Washington and the observed avalanche forecast from Mount Washington. So you, you couldn't really just give it different weather data and expect accurate forecast uh, predictions because it's, these models were made specifically for Mount Washington. But yeah, you're totally correct. Climate change effects are being delayed 
at different elevations. And we see that in our data. Now, I'll just add, Russ, this is a, a really big debate right now in the climate science community because it's very hard to find really good data sets of how, uh, of temperature, say, going back you know, more than just a few decades at high elevation. We've got great records at sea level all around the world, but very few from the tops of mountains. And so, for example, in Alaska, we've done research on uh, Mount Hunter in Denali, if anyone's familiar with Denali National Park. And there we found that the warming up on top of Mount Hunter at around 4,000 meters is actually faster than oh. the warming that you see at sea level in the rest of Alaska. So That's it's cool. not that everywhere is, you know, everywhere in the mountains is warming slower than at sea level. There are some places where it's actually warming faster. And so it's a really complex question. That is a cool result. I didn't know about that Alaska result. That's sweet. We got another question from Sarah. Sarah, you're officially unmuted. Okay. Uh, uh, my question was regarding emission reduction and it, are there further reports that uh, I could, maybe we could get a link to about what that actually looks like on the global scale um, at the different levels of prediction that they have agreed to at this point? Yeah, totally. I can go to the National um, Climate Assessment Report that I, that I featured in this. Let me see if I can find the correct slide. Yeah, so here's an example of some of the emission scenarios. So again, we, in this study, we focused on RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. So RCP 8.5 basically is saying that human population is going to increase and with it, carbon emissions will also increase. So RCP 8.5 is sort of like, we're not gonna do anything about emissions. We're just gonna keep emitting business as usual. So you can see this is the curve for RCP 8.5. Meanwhile, the lower scenario, RCP 4.5, we see a pretty extreme decrease in the carbon emissions, about back to the level at which we were at around 1970. But if you consider, if you think about that per capita, the human population has increased a lot since 1970. So that'd be a pretty drastic reduction in carbon emissions. And this, yeah. would, be a good, this would be a good reference for you if you'd like to read more about that. The, um, yeah, so the National um, Climate Assessment Report. So yeah, you can see 4.5, the lower scenario that Max used, that requires uh, very aggressive reductions in yes. CO2 emissions. We, basically the whole globe under that scenario peaks, like we reach a global peak in emissions in 2050 and decline thereafter. So that's, we're, we're certainly not on track to meet that at the moment, it's safe to say. Thank you. I'll jump in with a question that's related. Uh, in, in a best case scenario, this is from an optimist in the group. Um, yeah, awesome. <laughs> what does the RCP 2.6 look like? And is that something you bothered to look at? Oh, so our models for this study did not include RCP 2.6. But uh, as you can see by this, this, this same slide is very uh, relevant. RCP 2.6, we go back to like basically zero. We go to net zero carbon emissions, which would be extremely difficult. Hopefully we can go net negative maybe even one day. But um, yeah, that'd be a pretty drastic measure. We are definitely not on track to meet our CP 2.6. I yeah, hate, to, hate to crush the optimism, but. <laughs> that, that requires emissions globally yeah. this year in 2020. <laughs> yeah. That's, wow. that's the scenario. So it's, it's highly unlikely. Yes, um, we got a question from uh, Michael Kane, a professor at Northeastern. Um, cool. How well do you believe the downsampling model fits to fits fits to the extreme environments like Mount Washington? And Michael, if you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you if you want to clarify or add to that. Hang on to. You. Oops. Hang on. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, that's pretty much the question. Yeah, like the, the downsampling model like tries to fit the, to like take that Mario and make it a high resolution. Um, but how well does it really, like it might get the nice roundy of the belly, but how well does it get the roundness of the nose? 
Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, that analogy makes sense. That's an excellent question. I mean, any any modeler could would be skeptical about you know using these big models to predict weather at a place where you know we're above the atmospheric boundary layer on the top of Mount Washington. We're above the layer at which the air is affected by friction. So it, it is definitely difficult for the models to do so. We believe that the LOCA technique is the best technique to get like a good representation of the, the weather on the top of Mount Washington. And we also did a further bias corrections using just a delta change approach to the mm -hmm. temperature um, outputs of the GCMs, of the LOCA output, so that we could further bias correct the temperatures to be more like the Mount Washington temperatures. So we use a combination of the LOCA downscaling as well as a delta change approach with the actual station data from 1980 to 2005 to try to better bias correct those. Um, I think further, further work, one, one of the things we talked about for further uh, research was to try to actually downscale to the Mount Washington station. There are downscaling techniques to do that, but we did not use that in this study. We used the, the LOCA downscaling. But nice. yeah, excellent question. It definitely is difficult for models to capture such an extreme environment. I guess as a small follow-up, uh, where can the fellow nerds out there find the uh, where you where you're going to publish this in a journal? Oh, thank you. I mean, we don't know that yet. We're working on the manuscript actively, so uh, we'll we'll keep you posted on that one. I'm sure I'm sure I'll tell Frank, and <laughs> maybe M Black will post it. Thanks. Thank you. Great work. Michael, did you want to follow up with um, your other question you had there for seasonal factors? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess um, in terms of uh, avalanche activity, so your model looked like it looked at kind of variations throughout the day, like 24 hour temperature change, or maybe it was 48 and uh -huh. kind of variations in snowfall. But like, how do you think about that kind of early uh, frost tour layer that forms six weeks ago affects yeah. the avalanche activity of any given day? So this is why this kind of study and this method that I present here, like using avalanche forecasts and weather data, wouldn't be very useful in a place like Colorado, right? Where avalanches are really, really determined by past events and past layers placed down in the snowpack. So that is a really great question. I, I honestly can say that we don't um, can, like think about those in our model. We do try to think about five day snowfall, um, but in a maritime climate like Mount Washington, it's a little bit easier to ignore those kind of factors, but you're entirely correct. We don't, we don't pay attention to the layers that are underneath. A, me a mechanistic, like a more of a physical model would be able to capture that kind of thing. So if you did this study over again and did it more of a physical mechanistic model, then mm -hmm. we, could, we could definitely include, and there are a lot of uh, avalanche forecasting models which do include those kind of things. Nice. So excellent question. We've got another one that say, uh, what's the data being used for anything moving forward? Do you have any plans to keep going? Like I said, I mean, that's up to, uh, that's up to everyone. If they want to use the data set, the avalanche forecast data set, we can do whatever we want with this. As far as these results, this is the first time I'm presenting them publicly. So I, they, I, I can't t set, like talk of any kind of change this is making, but hopefully at least it keeps people's eyes open and, makes them think a little bit more about how climate change is affecting places we love like Mount Washington and how it's going to affect, like I said, midwinter conditions, especially on Mount Washington. Also, people might need to start planning their uh, springtime tux trips a little bit earlier into the season. <laughs> I doubt that we'll be, we'll be skiing the bowl in May for much longer. Sadly. I just want to add just from the strictly uh, the operational forecasting point of view to wet avalanches are one of the hardest types of avalanches to predict in any snow climate, whether it's direct action or indirect action like a continental snow climate. So these wet avalanche cycles, not only do they kind of tend to ruin skiing uh, in the short term, but also, um, you know, it's not pleasant to be in, but it is also a, a large and destructive avalanche that can re result and uh, they're not as easy to predict. So the wet avalanche activity that Colorado experienced that you referred to in one of the slides, yeah. um, I think it was last year, year before last, where they had rain right up to yeah. 14,000 feet. Pretty unprecedented and re resulted in historic avalanche paths and uh, quite destructive. And really from an infrastructure protection point of view, those are the things that um, can result in uh, you know, pretty, pretty calamitous events that um, 
you know, can really hurt people. We're, we're backcountry ski forecasting, you know, here it's not, a, there's not nearly as much at stake. So places where people interact with that avalanche terrain or live in that or adjacent to that avalanche terrain, that's the kind of scary part with the wet avalanches. Those, those also can come, uh, those wet avalanches can combine with other events as well and be, um, you know, huge. Um, so, uh, we've got a, a hand raise from, I believe this is Liz. Liz, you're yes, unmuted. Can you, oh, right. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Uh, just to be clear, so I know you had, you had said, um, Max, that, um, I had run the, the WBM model. I did not run the WBM model. My colleague, Danielle Grogan ran the WBM model. So I just yeah, want to make sure she gets credit. Another acknowledgement to Grogan. <laughs> All right. Yes. No, I extracted the data and, and, and provided it, but just want to make sure she gets her good credit. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. She gets, she definitely, sorry, I missed that. She gets her credit. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> <of> acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, so, and to going back to that other question, I don't know how I wasn't able to answer it, but um, the, the model does account for a lapse rate going back to the high altitude environment. So mm -hmm. the model is, is simulating what happens as elevation increases. And I think that that approach can be used with WBM for other regions. Um, but yeah, like you had said, when things get above the planetary boundary layer, the statistical downscaling probably is not gonna capture it as it's done currently. But new methods could certainly um, be developed to approach that, yeah. That's Just it. so everyone knows, that's Liz Burakowski that <laughs> Max referenced a bunch of times. And Liz, I'm going to leave you unmuted if that's okay with you. And if you want to jump in to answer any of these other questions that come up. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you so much, Liz. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> mm -hmm. For the, for the non-professorial uh, types uh, on board, I think the question from Chris Peter might be useful to address. Um, Max, you can take a crack at, crack at it or, uh, or totally. anyone else, but um, he, uh, your research does a great job showing a de decrease in our winter season, which is quite sad and makes sense for decreasing in the number of avalanches per year. Curious if you're, if you factored out shortened seasons and looked just at midwinter months and if they increase, remain stable or decrease in the future. And I think he probably means avalanche activity. Yeah, totally. So Chris, that's an excellent question. And it's sort of captured by these charts here. So I did not just for time and for too many charts, I didn't actually make one for avalanche activity, but because we know that avalanche activity is like trends so perfectly with like seasonal snowfall, I just included this chart. So we do see that and there's a big difference between the mission scenarios here. In the early spring, we see no changes in March under the lower emission scenario in a significant change in March under the high emission scenario. In either scenario, we see significant decreases in December, April, and May, but in both emission scenarios, we do not see a decrease in January or February. So snowfall and likely avalanche days, we do not project to decrease in midwinter months, January or February. And Excellent question. Thanks, Max. Mm -hmm. Got a question from Jason, maybe. Oh, for some reason that's not unmuting. So we'll jump over to Laura Hutchinson. Can you extrapolate, estimate how snowpack and avalanche conditions might change in other geographies based on the patterns that you observed and modeled on Mount Washington? Are the methods that you use replicable in other geographies? And if so, <clears throat> what might you change if they were to replicate this method in another geography? I think you touched on that, on that talking a little bit about out west, but. Yeah, no, totally. So yeah, Laura, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the awesome question. I can't like say, given my exact results, like I can't honestly say anything else about a different mountain range. But you know, like we talked, like Eric talked about in Alaska, the changes in different mountain regions due to climate change are different in different locations. So if we do see the same sort of changes due to climate change with the increasing temperatures, de decreasing snowfall, I would expect similar results to what we found. 
And as far as using our methods in other places, these methods are definitely, they can be used in any location with avalanche forecasts and weather data. Those are the only two, th two things we needed to make this study happen. The only problem is, like I talked about in continental snowpacks, avalanches aren't quite as closely tied to weather as they are in the maritime climates. So maritime climates like Pacific Northwest, Mount Washington, these are awesome places for this kind of method. But we could try the same method in the continental region, see if it meets similar results. You could always do it with another study using two different methods, see if they agree. So never say never, but I would say that this, this method works better in the maritime climates for sure. Got another question from Emily Bruckner. <clears throat> Even if we continue on at RCP 4.5, will we be able to level out with rising temps or will we perpetually continue to have a rise in temperatures affecting snowfall? So yeah, here, I'll pull up the temperature chart here. So we do, if you look at this chart, we do sort of level out towards the end of the 21st century, but it's still a really massive change. And by 2090, even in the low emission scenario, I'm still predicting that the daily temperature maximum will be above freezing. So that's by 2090. But yeah, we do see this level off where, as you can see in the high emissions, it just keeps trending up. And our, our results only show through the end of the 21st century. I don't know if they can even model past that, but I'm sure that trend keeps on going with increased emissions. But yeah, I mean, if, if we think about if your daily temperature at the end of the day, on average, is above freezing, every day on average, we're going to see a little bit of melt on Mount Washington, which is sort of crazy to think about. Yeah, I mean, that's the start of the corn cycle. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully it doesn't start in January. Yeah. <laughs> um, Seriously. Is the 60 and 50% increase in wet avalanche days compared to the present conditions or projected conditions? Yeah, so that's projected. And that's the, the percent changes from 2020 to the end of the 21st century. So a 60% change from now until the end of the 21st century. Okay, here's, uh, we got uh, one more question from Michael Kane. Maybe, yeah, there you go. I'm sorry, you said my name, but I, are you saying that I asked a question? Yeah, I thought you had your hand raised, no? Oh, that might have been from before. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, all right, well, we'll finish it up. It's almost eight o'clock and Adam Libby's asking, what can we do as individuals to help? Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. I honestly can't say I'm extremely um, knowledgeable on the subject. There's people that could answer this a lot better than I can, but reducing your footprint, pushing for more sustainable policies and more sustainable or administrations that want to push for more sustainable policies and doing what you can to help try to reduce your own footprint and your neighbor's footprint and the region's footprint. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot on that topic. I don't, I don't feel too. Um, I'm not the I'm not the one to go to about that. It's a pretty sad question. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'm doing. So that's here, Eric. As a, as a climate scientist who is very concerned about this, what my family and I are doing, we are, we are getting community solar power. So we're trying to purchase more renewable electricity for our own home. We consider energy whenever we make a major purchase, like a new car, a new appliance, something that's gonna be with you for years, right? You make a, you make a conscious decision about energy. I'm trying to skip at least one airplane flight a year I think a lot about my air travel and you know when I think about vacations now it's not just can we afford it financially and can we afford it like time away from work I now think about can we afford it from a carbon perspective too and it doesn't mean that the answer is always no we're not going to go on vacation but it's now part of our calculus um, we're eating less beef because there's a, a big impact, a much larger carbon footprint from beef compared to say chicken or even uh, you know, any other white meat basically. We try and support companies, local companies that make climate part of their priorities and, and are trying to be good citizens from a climate and carbon perspective. And I vote for people, for, for leaders who make it part of their platform and make it part of their priorities. So that's what I'm just, that's just personally what I do. Uh, as, as somebody who is concerned about this. 
Uh, I guess I could tack on to that as another climate scientist. Um, our family just bought our first home within the past year or two. And one of the first things we did was looked up the New Hampshire Saves Program, which provides a lot of credits. Um, and I think we even got a couple thousand dollars to help upgrade the insulation and make the home more efficient. So if you're in New Hampshire, uh, definitely check out the New Hampshire Saves Program. They've actually upped the credit limit this year. So they're offering not just credits, but also low interest loans. Uh, ours just gets tacked on to our electric bill. And we've already seen like probably about a $70 a month decrease in our electric bill mm. with electric heat. That makes a big difference. Um, and then I also like to just say, talk about climate change. Uh, it's a tough topic for some folks to bridge, especially with uh, family members and friends who might see things a lot differently, but identify those shared values. For me, it's usually something like ice fishing or Mm -hmm. skiing, just enjoying snow and, um, you know, talking about it from the perspective of this is something we care about and it's something I care about for my kids in the future. And for my family, that means their grandkids or their nieces and nephews. And I think that can be a, a good starting point is just find out what you both love and, and find ways to move forward from there. But also a lot of the other stuff that Eric talked about as well, reducing your own footprint is a, a big step and voting is a huge step. Make sure people are on board with what you want to see in your future, in your community, and in the world. Thanks, Liz. Uh, appreciate all that input and jumping in. Um, I thought we had you as a panelist in there, so I think I might have fumbled that around. But next time, we'll get you back on board. And uh... I might have clicked the wrong link, too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Frank, you want to um, sign us off? Thanks. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for your hard work, Max, and your presentation and your dedication to this important work and looking forward to putting that machine learning tool to work for our fifth snow ranger here coming up soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Eric, thanks for thanks for the mentorship for for Max and we're looking forward to seeing what else he does with this and uh, thank you all for joining in your questions and uh, do tune in again. Um, this year, we'll do more of these um, on a variety of subjects, snow and avalanche related, uh, try to leverage this uh, time we have found for ourselves at home in front of the internet. So take care and enjoy. Great right. job, Max. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job, Max. Thanks, Eric.